All right, so we're going to hit up our cars routine. We're going to start off with neck. Want to make that circle as big as possible. If you have pain, please stop. We're going to get three each way. The goal is to try to lock in that joint above and below. We're going to transition down to spine. So now we're going to lock in that joint above and that joint below. So hug yourself again, crunch it down. Now we're going to move on to our scapula. Our scapula are those two floating bones in the back of our shoulders there. They're sit on our back like this. And the goal from a visual representation is to make a circle where they're moving around as big as possible. So we're going to move our arms straight out in front and you'll notice that my hands will stay still as possible but I'm going to try to move my scapulas around my body. So a big conscious focus on keeping that joint above, meaning your arms, and that joint below, my ribs and my back, as locked in as possible so I can isolate my scapulas in that big 360 degree sphere of motion I'm trying to get. Three forward, three back, make that circle as big as possible. Now we're gonna to transition to shoulder. We'll do one arm at a time here. A lot more things to manage here, considering I'm gonna make a big 360 degree sphere. So what we like to say is keep that side from the ribs to the hip locked in. That foot's heavy, that rib's locked in. And then as we start to move our shoulder, we're gonna get as much rotation without changing my body's orientation. So lock in, create pressure, pack the air down and in, come up and across. Notice how my arm is staying externally rotated as long as I can. Rotate that arm in as I come back. And when I get to the side here, I'm gonna reverse by pushing my thumb back as far as I can without feeling pain and stopping when I need to stop. And then start to slowly unravel, come back up, down the same way I went up. We're gonna go three on the right. Locking in that same side position so those ribs and those arms and those hips do not move. Just focusing exclusively on that shoulder and getting as much rotation, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction as I possibly can. We'll go on to the other side. Again, start off with the arm there. Pack in that rib. Come on up. Rotate around. Three. Each circle, try to make bigger and bigger. Once we're done with three here, we're gonna move on to elbow. On elbow, we're gonna lock in our elbow position, so we'll rotate our arms outwards. Now that joint above is now my shoulder, and my joint below is my wrist, so I wanna lock those two in. I'm gonna flex at the elbow, rotate my arm in, come on back down. The other way you can explain this is a supinated position into a pronated position. Three, and then we're gonna move on to wrist. Now on the wrist, that joint above is this forearm, so I want to avoid pronating and supinating. I want to stay in this fixed position. And that joint below are my fingers. So I want to lock in my fingers and lock in that forearm. If I'm struggling, if I'm going here and I'm moving my arms, we can simply lock it in and create a block here. And if I'm struggling to maintain my finger position, I can just make a closed fist. But as a whole, we want to start off here. Forearms are pointed in the same direction as we start. Come on in, 
make the circle as big as you can coming around and then we're going to rotate facing the other way if you're struggling again to keep that forearm fixed just grab that wrist if you're struggling again to control your fingers make a closed fist goal is to make that circle as big as possible without making any changes at the forearm or the fingers three and then we're going to move on to hip so hip we treat the same way as our shoulder lock in that same rib position for balance grab on something to solid i'm just going to do this directly in front of you so we're going to bring this knee up i'm thinking lock in that rib position lock in my torso position bring that knee up as high as you can rotate pull that knee out as i'm pulling it out my sternum my belly button are pointing straight ahead rotate while keeping that knee up push that knee back a little bit of extension and then we're going to come on back drive up and around into the start we're going to go three each way here remember keeping this torso in this fixed position so i'm not rotating i'm not leaning i'm not bending i'm just trying to stay as locked in it's, it's like a statue up here so if the leg is locked in make that circle and that sphere as big as you possibly can Imagine I have a dot that's going over my knee. I'm trying to make that dot, make it as big as possible circle as I can. We'll go on to the other side here. If you're struggling to maintain position, even holding on, create tension in the opposite side. So if I want to create something here, I'm holding on here, create tension, lock it in. It's just about giving feedback to get that right joint moving at the right time and the right sequence. We're gonna go three each way here. Make that circle bigger and bigger every time. Create tension, create stability. Lock in that joint above by not leaning and not collapsing. Control your body while you move a joint through space. Last two, we're gonna make our way to the ground. So we're gonna find something stable. Seat here. We're gonna hug the back of our leg. So if you can, Create as much of a lock or anchor point on that joint above or that bone above being our upper leg. And we're gonna to try to fix that so I can get as much rotation at this knee with the shin rotating out. So we're gonna start off with the shin rotating out. We're gonna extend up, rotate that shin in, come on down, keeping that leg pointed in, come on up, extend, come on down. And we're gonna repeat that process two more times for a total of three reps. We're actually going to stay in the same leg. And we're going to lower our guard. So we're going to simply lower that guard down to our shin now. So I'm locking in that joint above. And this looks similar to what we're doing on the wrist. It's exactly what it is. We're going to treat the wrist the same way as our ankle. It's just hard to govern our ankle without giving some feedback here. So we're going to go one ankle at a time. And we're just going to make that circle as big as possible. Now, fortunately, you can't really see my toes, so that joint below is a little easier to manage on our feet than it is our hands, because we have more dexterity there. But we still want to be cognizant of where my toes are going as I'm making this circle around that ankle. Three each way there, and we're going to transition to the other side. So we'll go the lock here, brace it up. We'll go three, and then we'll lower ourselves down to our shin, and we'll finish off on that final ankle. That's it. Today we're going to need one or two kettlebells. I'm going to give you two different options. One if you have both kettlebells and then obviously if you only have one, how to do today's exercise. We're going to open up today with some rocking, nodding, and rib rolling. So just get yourself on all fours, knees, and then we actually like to start off with our feet a little closer together. And as we go through this, if we're feeling like we want a little bit more of a stretch, we can widen out our knees and then we can simultaneously widen out our feet. But just start off in a good comfortable position. We're just going to transition forward and back if you feel like you can get pretty good flexion of your hip meaning getting your butt all the way back down to your heels just widen out your knees just a little bit make it a little bit more challenging goal of this though is just working on some flexion of the hip on this quadruped position trying to get a little bit of mobility in the knee get a little bit of mobility in the hip as you go forward you can widen out a little bit with the feet and get a little bit more of a stress and a stretch going on into that hip 
10 here. Once you're done with 10, we're just gonna sit back down on our heels. We're gonna lock in that lumbar position. So when I'm flexing the hip, that low back actually locks in, which is a really good thing to figure out because we're gonna go through some cervical motion here, meaning some nodding. So we're gonna look up and down. And I wanna get true motion going on in that neck. So I wanna lock in that joint below, specifically that lumbar, so I have no motion going on there. We're gonna go 10, up and down trying to get that chin as high as we can and that chin as low as we can. Once we're done with 10 there, we're gonna go into rotation, or as we say, just say no. Try to get that chin as far over that shoulder as you can. 10 each way. And then we're gonna to transition to lateral flexion or bringing my ear to shoulder. So we'll line up our head with our shoulder height. Try to touch that ear each direction. And we'll go 10 again here. And we're gonna finish up with some rib rolling. So now with that lumbar position locked in, we're trying to create as much rotation in our thoracic spine as we possibly can. So sit your butt back down on your heels and just lock in that lumbar position. We're gonna slide that hand underneath, grab your rib, pull, without that hand sliding, so we just actually want to truly rotate as much as we can, and then back down. We're gonna go five, each direction here. And then we'll switch. Four and five. Okay, so let's get, to, let's get to work. So today we're gonna go set and clean. We have options if we have two kettlebells, we have options if we have one. So what we're trying to do now is figure out what logistical things we need to get through. Obviously we need a little bit of space, we need ground, we're gonna be setting this, so if you have hardwood floor, just be conscious of it. As you get fatigued, it's probably gonna hit. Uh, if you need a little bit of solid, more surface, great find it. Um, if we have one kettlebell, equally as effective, we're just going to go double up. So you're going to go five in the right, five in the left. And the end goal above all anything else in this is building capacity with the tools that we have while biomechanically staying in line. So we're going to set it on the ground every single time. And we find that this is a really good strategy to pre preserve technique when we start getting tired. So if you need to pause in the middle of that set, so if I'm on set, set six, and I'm on rep three, and I'm really struggling to maintain position or keep a good back position, just pause on the ground for a little bit longer, you know, and just make sure that we're getting good quality as we start to increase volume as we go. But today's workout is gonna be eight sets of five, set and clean. So we start on the ground, and we finish on the ground for every rep for five reps. Just a demonstration purpose with two kettlebells, Set up in a good hinge position. I'm gonna do a side angle here. So shins vertical, torso's there. My bells are out in front. From here, if I have two kettlebells, we're gonna to have to go a little bit wider than we normally do. So maybe a swing of about hip width apart. We're just gonna simply widen out the shoulder width apart. Still want the same hinge mechanics, so I'm gonna have clearance for both those kettlebells coming through. Start off with the bells in front. Tip them down towards you, tuck your chin. Swing through, drive, absorb and then back down. That would be an example of a double, and we can just simply do the same thing with a single. We'll just have to do five on the right, five on the left. Set up, through, and then back down. That would be five right, five left. All right, eight sets of five. We're gonna go at a pace that hopefully we could sustain. The goal again is capacity, quality, and getting a really good training effect with minimal tools. And we could do that, we just always need to put quality above all else, and then we need to make sure that we're training really hard and focused. All right, all right, so if you have two kettlebells, let's go ahead, grab them. If you got one kettlebell, grab them. I'm gonna go double, so it's gonna be a little quicker. If you have one, obviously each set's gonna take twice as long. So if you need to catch up at all, if you need help counting, uh, just please by all means, pause me and then get your set and then restart. All right, so here we go. First set. All right, if you're doing one arm, keep going. 
controlling that breath, hinging appropriately, loading it. You'll notice that I'm rotating my arm, so I'm gonna go through some different keys and nuances as we go through this. But technique, technique, technique. If I'm really, if that's really light and you wanna go faster, build that capacity, it's great. If you wanna go a little longer and you wanna get a little bit more rest in between, so the quality is there, because you have two 32 kilo kettlebells, by all means, just make it look good as the biggest governor. I could put some constraints on it, say take 60 seconds rest, but we don't know the load you have. We don't know the experience you have on this. So just making sure that you're always putting quality above all else. When in doubt, go longer so it's higher quality. All right, set two. Now, when we're doing cleans, you'll see a, typically early on, with people who are learning, is this big crash effect, right? So the first time you do it, it bangs, it lands on your, on your forearms, which is really uncomfortable, and we're really aware of that. The biggest cue I can say is make contact early. So as we're coming up, and I'm moving or underneath it, I'm thinking contact the kettlebell here, and then push under. So that power I drive through, and then from here it's about just absorbing that load of the kettlebell before I receive it up here. So I'm thinking as soon as I get up, I'm contacting here, and I just push up, or I give myself an uppercut to my chin. Gets a little bit of experience. One thing that's really nice about high volume kettlebell work, it grooves this pattern, meaning I have to find the most efficient way to do this to mitigate that crashing effect, as well as the cardiorespiratory effect, as well as the biomechanical effect. So I don't want to strain my back. I don't want to strain anything else. I want to make sure that I'm moving efficiently and effectively. Set three, let's get it. Make sure that you're hitting early and drive up underneath. So the other thing, if you're struggling to avoid that huge crash effect and you got two kettlebells, it'll be easier to learn with one. So at any point, if this is really starting to like, I'm not getting that concept of making contact early and then driving underneath, it's easier to do with one kettlebell. So ditch the other kettlebell and just go back down to one, make that contact drive underneath. And that goal though is again, like really good positioning, really good control on top of getting really good capacity, right? So biomechanics governs our function. When we get a lot of volume, we want to get strength, we want to get cardiovascular fitness, we also need to, so we're only as good as what we can do with movement wise. So building that pattern up, eventually if this gets so sore that you're banging so hard and you're not be able to get through it based off of without too much pain, kind of defeats the purpose. So if you need to go to one and make contact and manage it a little easier, you'll notice your right and your left are just gonna be different. And then add in the other kettlebell so you can add that skill of doing two at once, great. A little bit more quicker, a little bit faster, probably get a little bit more load. But the end goal is if biomechanics aren't there, don't worry about two, just go one. Let's get set four here. Some other things you might notice. So if I was gonna take a freeze frame of me in this bottom position, if I was gonna go right into a swing or go right into a clean, it should look uniform. I shouldn't be able to tell the difference. And I think it's an important distinction here because it's that same mechanism, just a different outcome, right? So if I wanted to finish here, even if I wanted to finish here, that same build or that prep should be the same here. And that corkscrew mechanic of rotating our arm in and getting that rotation in to create more stability when I'm at that most flexed position of my hip, such a valuable thing to learn and get in there. We talked about it the other day with our Anywhere program of can I rotate my joints to close up that space to make more compression and more stability. And when I'm moving something fast, something long, 
I want to have ultimate mobility. I want to be able to flex in my hip. I want to have good rotation. But I also want to squeeze things out so I can get more compression, so I can move here without dissipating energy. So it's that interplay between lengthening and compressing something and moving at the right time that gets me the most actual value from it and the most overall more force, moving things faster, going longer with more efficiency. And that biomechanical aspect, I can't stress that enough. Build that, man, and everything else will happen that you want. I want to get stronger. I want to get faster. I want to get leaner. All that will come from building out really good movements and then layering on all those other variables on top of it. All right, step five. Great start position. All right, almost there. We got three more rounds. If you're feeling good and you want to pick up the pace, go for it. If you're feeling like I need to slow down a little bit, I'm getting a little fatigued, slow down, pause the video, get a drink, find something to help you make sure that quality's there, right? Other big keys is that hinge position with double kettlebells and things that are rotating. There's just a lot more complexity and nuance. But at the end of the day, it's still got to be a vertical shim, flex tip, neutral flat back, chin tucked. Like that hinge position, whether I'm doing dumbbell RDL, barbell RDL, doing a single leg RDL, doing a single arm swing, doing a double arm swing, doing kettlebell clean, this always has to be there. And I need to be able to express that above all else. This is that platform which you're building. We've started with a base, so build that movement pattern, and now we're layering in more complexity and more variables like force or capacity or velocity. And that's how the magic of secret sauce is, is have that potential or have that range and then add, add, add. But we can't skip that step. Movement has to be the thing that comes first before we can get into the fun stuff. Build that movement, build that mobility, build that stability, build that movement pattern, and then the sky's the limit. We can get whatever we want for as long as we want, as long as we have that foundational piece of the movement pattern there. And these are really strategic in terms of why we choose these, because we feel like we can get a lot of results in a very short period of time, as long as we have that order or sequence. All right, let's get to set six. Chin tuck, good hinge position, load. All right, we've got two more rounds, 10 more reps total. All right, keep working your positions. If you need a break, please get yourself a drink. Pause, make sure you're doing this right. Quality, quality, quality. One last kind of key component I wanna go through, and it's always really imperative to go through on the swing, is controlling your breath, right? Whenever I'm overcoming something, I wanna breathe out. Whenever I'm loading something, or I'm eccentrically loading, I wanna breathe in. And that process too of like, looking at like I'm overcoming gravity, and I have this, thing like called strength curve, meaning I'm gonna be stronger as I go upwards. I wanna now breathe out and reset and load while I'm through that end range or that most flex position or the weakest part of that strength curve and build up that pressure inside here to control that load. And all above all else, the timing of that, we don't, we probably don't give it enough service, but if I can manage that, I can manage my positions and I know how to control the fixed points, whether it's the the bottom on the ground or on my shoulder, you're gonna have a really good opportunity to be successful. And it's just all about picking things that we know that we can fix. I can fix your breath, I can fix your feet, I can fix your hands, and I can put you in a position to be successful. And we can get this whole other thing that we never expected. Great results without pain. What an amazing thought. Imagine if I can move aggressively and long and fast and heavy without pain. And I can look the way I wanna look and I don't have to sacrifice everything to get it. That's the construct here. That's what we're trying to build. It's fo focusing on things that get you where you want to be and not sacrificing anything that we don't have to sacrifice. Let's get this round seven. One more round. One more round. If you got it, go for it. Finish. You need a little break? Please do it. You know, just make sure this last round is your best round. You've now done seven sets. 
that's been really great effort, really great focus, great attention to detail. That movement pattern is locked down. You're intense there. Now's the time to really make sure that you get what you want to get out of this. Finish strong, get that last great effort towards a really good set here, and then make sure you walk away from here with your head held high, knowing you did the best possible job you could. Set eight. Woo! That's it, we're an amazing day. So L do, we got three big stretches. L5, S1, T8, T9, and T6, T7. Now, here's the logistics of this all. You know, a lot of us don't have a lot of available wall space, specifically close to the ground. So hopefully we can give some strategies where we can go over some different things to hold those stretch positions while still getting the same effect. So if you have a wall, obviously put your legs up on the wall. That's our easiest, most tangible way to do L5, S1. If we don't, we're gonna grab a chair or a, or a bench. We're just gonna put our legs up on the bench like such. Now, when our legs are long, the rule is dorsiflex, rotate in. When our legs, are, our knees are bent, now we're actively pushing our toes forward. And we call this position, that knee bent position, because we're trying to create an anchor or a fixed point. And what you'll notice automatically, that's gonna rotate your femurs in. From here, L5S1 is all about creating distraction. So I'm gonna press up, and then in this position, I'm pulling my fingers back, and then pushing my palms away. So while I'm in this position, I'm pushing my toes forward and I'm pushing my hands away to create as much separation essentially from my toe and my palms as I possibly can. In this position, focus on your diaphragmatic breathing. We're gonna hold this stretch for 60 seconds. If you don't have a stopwatch or a watch at all, or you just don't know how to count for uh, whatever reason, it's nice. It's actually easy to count your breaths. Each breath takes roughly about four to five seconds. So if you get roughly, what's the math there? 10 of them? Yeah, about 50 seconds, you're probably in a good spot right there. So we'll go 10 deep breaths in that position, slowly unwind, and then transition out. So the second one we can just do right here on the ground. Remember again, with our knees bent, we're rotating our toes down into the ground. So this is T8, T9. So pull your heels in, rotate your big toes down into the ground. We're gonna pull our torso forward. Now, if this is what I got while I can hold this position, this right here is better than that. And what I mean by that is we're looking for full flexion and pushing my palms as far away from my heels. And we're talking about distance, this is actually this is actually better than that. So we want to create that position of anchoring my toes in, fixing that pelvis, and then we want to pull our, tar our torso as far away from that as possible. And if I don't have adequate shoulder flexion or hip flexion, we just need to go here, all right? So option one, set up here. Option two, hold here. And again, we're gonna hold this for 10 deep breaths in or 60 seconds. and we'll slowly pull ourselves out of that. Last one, T6, T7. So we're gonna set up our legs wide. We're gonna pull our toes in, because our legs are long, and then we're gonna rotate them down. Remember, every time my legs are extended, I take this dorsiflexed and internal rotated position of the leg, and then I go into my stretch from there. From here, now I'm trying to pull out on these facets or these transverse processes in an oblique direction. So instead of going straight up, we're gonna make a Y. And we're gonna hold this stretch position for again, 10 deep breaths or 60 seconds.
Awesome, thank you guys. We'll finish up with some breathing. Have a great one. So we're gonna go into breathing now. We're looking for breathing as this normal sequence thing we're trying to do, depending on our position. So the first order is going through how we wanna breathe. Breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth is the appropriate timing and rhythm of this. And what we're doing on that is to creating a really good diaphragmatic contraction, as well as teaching inhale and, and exhale kind of a focus there. And what we're gonna do is change our position. And really we're just gonna define like, for you, find the position where, depending on how hard you just trained, or what our ultimate goal is to get the best respiration mechanics possible. And we have three different positions we can really leverage here. You know, the first position is gonna be a crocodile position. So I'm lying on the ground. I have my hands underneath my forehead, and then I'm just gonna breathe in that position. And that is a great position for general relaxation. Uh, we have a lot of surface area on the ground, so we can get a really good, relaxing breath work done. Now, what's interesting behind that, though, is I'm actually pushing against the ground with my stomach. So now when I inhale, I have to create more pressure so I spread myself out over that ground. So if I'm struggling to take air in, a crocodile position might be a really good strategy for to use. A second position is a 90-90. So you can find a wall, you can find a, a bench, you can find something like a couch or at home where I'm putting my knee or my feet up on that fixed position. So imaginary chair underneath my feet here. And what that is, is it's going to be a little easier to take air in because I don't have anything blocking it. But you're going to find as I breathe in, maybe that low back comes off the ground. So I need to be a little bit more efficient at creating stability without that external feedback. But we need to be really good at pushing that air out. And you can further accentuate that up by elevating and pushing through your heels and creating what they call a hemi bridge. And that's going to take that pelvis and put it in a different position. And that's going to create a whole different emphasis. If you're normally a person that inhales and arches their back, it might feel really, really challenging. You might feel a crampy sensation. And now this is taking respiration and breathing into a little bit more of a training exercise. So depending on where we're at, if we're really struggling with inhalation, get on the ground, go crocodile breathing. If you really want to work on more mechanics of breathing and work on more exhalation, get into a 90-90. And then the final position is an inverted position. So you can go up on stacked up on some books, or you can just simply take our body at a negative angle angle, meaning that my hips are higher than my, my torso, you just simply go in a kneeling and elbow position. And the goal being is the more inverted I am, the more requirement I'm going to have for exhalation. And it's going to be harder to take breath in. So you actually feel a premature block in there because when we breathe, that diaphragm actually contracts and we're going now against gravity. Right, so normally that diaphragm can just drop and descend. It still contracts, but it has the assistance of gravity. Now we're actually going against gravity, and we have to push up and away in that. The more inverted I am, the more impact it has on that, and you'll feel a premature block on that. And what we really need to do on that is taking it away from that inhal inhalation and more towards the exhalation. And now we have to really work to push that air out to really create that pressure that we need. And as we go through the spectrum of this, I just train my tail off. I'm really tired. I really want to get some good parasympathetic kind of re breathing and relax, go into a crocodile position. If I'm feeling okay and I still want to work in some good strategies, whether inhale or exhale, but I want to get a little bit more a little bit more impact from that, go into a 90-90 position. And then I really want to work an exhalation strategy get into that inverted position, elevate yourself on some extra pillows or some books, or if you have some balance pads at home, to get a little bit more of that negative pressure so I can push against the impact of gravity with that diaphragm. Find whatever strategy works best for you. Still gonna keep that same rhythm, of breathing in throughout the nose. We can accentuate that diaphragmatic contraction by pushing our tongue to the roof of the mouth. We can accentuate it a little bit further by getting a cadence to it. We can hit a four, four, eight tempo, meaning four seconds in, four second hold, eight seconds out, and then we can actually utilize the final four, holding that breath out for four. And what this does is really tries to control and give some deliberate emphasis towards that specific area that we really typically need to work. And that focus on breathing out with a forceful contraction to activate that diaphragm in any position is always a great strategy. If you just want to relax and breathing and do an inventory from head to toe, also great. But make sure that we're getting this breathing component in, especially in these periods that we feel like we're having a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of stuff that we just simply have no control over. Get grasp of how you can control that one 
one to two minutes on any given day that whenever you want through your breathing. 